Hi, Gadget UK here again. As you can see, a uh, quick look here at the CD32 again. Just trying to perfect the alignment of the pots. Now, someone has messed with the alignment of those pots. Uh, and the reason I know that is because the ADRF level was quite low, even when I've adjusted the, uh, the laser voltage there on the uh, optical pickup unit. Um, now, I found a really useful video. I think it was, uh, was it M. Nerny? Um, I'll post his name up, up here. Thankfully, he had uh, made a note of the resistances that those pots were set to on one of his. Now, bear in mind, they're, they're going to vary from drive to drive. They're never going to be exactly the same, but they're going to be always in approximately the same position, you know, similar position. Um, there may be examples out there where they're, quite, uh, they're set quite a lot different, but I suspect mo for the most part, most drives are going to have those pots set to very, very, very similar positions um, and they're just tweaked at manufacture there to uh, you know take into account differences between the tracking coils and the focus coils and the, the laser and the uh, all the different sort of manual aspects there that can vary ever so subtly um, so what I wanted to do was try and get the RF level up a little bit and I managed to do that by adjusting the pots there to um, the values he had in his video so that was a good head start and straight away it's given me total reliability with audio CDs because that was one problem I was having it worked okay with press discs, you know, games and things running fine, but audio CDs were just, it's like the tracking was out a little bit. Certainly when you got up the disc, you know, to beyond sort of track 10 or 11 on this particular one, this has got 14 tracks. So I figured, yeah, it needed to be dialed in a little bit further. Uh, so I had a look at uh, Retro Game Mods video, again I'll post a link in the description below. It's a four hour video as I've mentioned previously, there's a lot to watch there but it's a really good video. So uh, just using some of the tips and uh, tricks and things I picked up in that video where he reverse engineered the, uh, the, the, the PCB there and worked out what everything, you know, how everything was um, uh, related, you know, how the pots related and how they can, adjusting one can affect the other. There's a, you know, there's a lot of uh, trial and error there and you've got to really follow that video all the way through to understand uh, entirely what's actually required uh, to do it properly. But I'm going to have a quick go now on the scope. I've got the scope set up here, um, as you can see. So the RF level, each division, each block here is, um, each division is uh, 200 millivolts. So we've got actually more than we had before uh, just from adjusting the pots to you know, a sort of factory setting if you like. We've got one, two, three, pretty much four. We've got 800 millivolts peak to peak there. So that's actually a lot better than it was in the previous video. I think in the previous video we had like 600. So we seem to have gained a couple of hundred millivolts straight, you know, right off the bat there. Um, the other thing that's got me puzzled is the lasers I've got, the pot positions are nowhere near the original one was. And that could be, there's a different size variable resistor on there. Um, I haven't had time to check that. that, that's a possibility. You know, it's not like a 100% like-for-like replacement pickup unit. It's, uh, uh, you know, like I say, it could have a different pot on there. It could even have a different laser diode on there that's roughly has the same characteristics as the, you know, the original ones. So those are the sort of things you can get when you start buying cheap replacements and things from eBay, you know, from China or Hong Kong or wherever. Um, you know, wherever's made, a, 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 you know, a, a, an equivalent part so I'm adjusting the uh, FEB, Focus Error Balance, I think it is, or is it Bias? I'm bang, it's Balance. Uh, and you can see, as if I turn it one way, I'm going to turn it counterclockwise. See, it's gone down, and I can hear the drive struggling. As I turn it the other way, it's gone up, and then again, I'm going clockwise. We get to a similar situation where you can hear the disc making a noise. And I'll just put you near the drive, actually, and you can actually hear the, um, hopefully, if I get you close enough, you'll be able to hear the difference as I put that out of uh, tolerance here, hang on, not really tolerance, out of, um, you know, it's optimal saying, just listen, hang on, you know, it's skipping, going back the other way, do you hear that, struggling, and on the scope, the that's when the uh, signal is um, not very optimal at all, so I would hazard a guess that somewhere optimal is around that point there actually where that is um, I'll just show you that again actually so just trying to get that optimal I would suggest that's that's about the optimal position for the uh, FEB. Uh, so I'll have a look at the focus gain now, I think. 
Yeah, so focus gain is the one furthest away from the uh, drive, which I, again, I'll, like I say, I'll show you the pots in a minute. So we're just going to tweak that slightly, going uh, clockwise, anti-clockwise, near the drive. Yeah, so the interesting thing is here, I'll show you this, if I adjust the uh, focus, focus uh, gain, just listen. Can you hear the drive? So yeah, that wants to be almost round to its extreme position actually. And in terms of the RF level, it's making very little difference at all. Adjusting that pot and looking at the RF signal, we see next to no difference actually. It's bouncing up and down there, can you see that? So we might be able to uh, see a difference there now. Let's try again. Yeah, it's making very little difference. So just using the tracking error balance pot TB, can you see the same thing happens if I'm going, uh, let me go clockwise, right, clockwise is a spot bigger, it's going smaller, smaller, go back uh, anti-clockwise, bigger, bigger, and then it starts to go smaller. So there is an optimal point there, this is exactly what Retro Game Mods was uh, showing on this video, so that's super useful in that I'm seeing exactly the same thing here, and I'm able to replicate uh, the adjustment just the same way. So that's pretty much three of the pots done actually so that finally leads to the uh, tracking uh, error gain I think that is TG so that's the second to last pot on the drive there so again we probably won't see any difference here if I'm uh, thinking correctly yeah there's no, it makes next to no difference up to the RF level so we need to look at uh, one of the other uh, lines for that I think so just testing with the CDR here now you can see we've got three almost three divisions so we're a bit less uh, than 600 millivolts there I might just try and increase the laser pot just a little bit, see if that uh, brings the RF level up a bit. But it's quite strange because this uh, this laser, I'll show you the pot in a minute, it's wildly different to the original one was. You know, the other one was like kind of centred, um, which is about right for most uh, optical pickup units really. They tend, tend to be sort of somewhere near the middle roughly, or you know, slightly offset one way or the other but not to the extreme, whereas this is not getting far off being, you know, sort of three quarters the way wound around. Now if the pot size is different, that could account for that. So just testing on the uh, press disc again, I'll just press play. Uh, I probably need to mute that, otherwise I'm going to get a copyright strike. And you can see, actually, it's a bit too high now. Uh, we're aiming for about a volt, and we've got one, two, three, four, five, and three quarters maybe five and a half so we've got uh, over a volt there we've got like one point uh, almost 1.2 volts actually uh, so I just need to just tweak it down you know anti-clockwise just a tiny tiny bit get this to a volt because it's not made any difference to the CDR um, the CDRs are still working perfectly and that, I still got a skip on Simon the Sorcerer what I'm going to try and do with that game is uh, burn it again at single speed uh, or as near to uh, you know a, a slow speed, six uh, double speed or whatever you know the lowest speed I can burn it at because I think the disc I'm testing with at the moment is a verbatim, but it's burnt at 52 speed. Uh, so I have found you know that's a, a correction since the last video. I found that you can burn at 52 speed for the most part. It seems all right. Um, you don't need to burn at the low speed that I was having to do in the previous video. And actually, I think from previous experience, I've found that if you need to pay a lot of attention to the burn speed with CDR media. Sometimes it's an indication the RF level's not strong enough, you know, you've got the laser voltage set a bit too low. Um, as soon as you tweak the laser voltage up to a, a level where the RF level comes up to an acceptable level, the 
burn speed then becomes less of a problem but that's not true of the DVD-R media you know like Xbox and GameCube those are mega sensitive to the burn speed whereas uh, it seems like CDRs uh, if you get the uh, laser uh, configured properly it's uh, a bit more forgiving and the burn speed is not so much of a problem sometimes it is on some systems there are some systems I've mentioned in the past so I've just muted that uh, one thing I found is it's pretty easy to adjust this just looking at the RF level actually certainly let's say the first two pots um, have a big adjust, big, big effect there on the level you know you can see it uh, you know it goes it shrinks or it grows on either side you know either direction so it's quite easy to dial those first two pots in so that's working fine uh, so what I would share what to share really from my experience here is the first adjustments here, TEB and FEB, the first two pots on the drive. Those are the ones where when you tweak the screwdriver clockwise or anti-clockwise, the, the RF level goes like that. So it's easy just to, to find the sweet spot. There is a sweet spot of, a, I don't know, five, four or five degrees there where you can get it so the RF level's optimal. Uh, and just test at the start of a disc and at the end of a disc, you know, get along a disc like I've got here where you've got 14 or more tracks and you've got uh, a track that's uh, right on the outer edge there just to, to get it perfect and then the final two pots there uh, the gains tracking error gain and uh, focus error gain uh, teg and feg those two um, the easiest way to adjust that is to get your ear super close to the unit here uh, and adjust them that way you can hear it actually um, if I just, I'll give you an example, if I just uh, mess around with the end one there, just listen, hopefully you can hear this. Can you hear it? So it's having to do more work, you can hear the servos, you know, the uh, coils there, having to do a lot more work when you get it out of uh, calibration, you know, out of uh, optimal setting. So it's super easy to do that, actually, to, on, on both the tracking and the focus there on those final two pots you can hear a noticeable difference and actually they're both pretty much wound to their extremes the minimum lowest level really there's hardly any uh, gain on the tracking or focus on my unit here now that could be because someone's messed around with the um, spindle height as well because I think they have uh, I, I, I suspect so I suspect there's two things has happened to this unit someone's first of all tried adjusting the um, spindle height and then I think they've messed with those four pots. The interesting thing is they didn't touch the original laser pot. It was still, you know, the glue was still there in place. I had to crack that to uh, adjust it when I first adjusted it in part one. Uh, I didn't mention it, but yeah, that, uh, that you know, uh, glue, the blob of glue that was on there had never been shifted. Uh, so it's strange how someone would come into a unit like this and start messing around with the, the, the tracking and uh, uh, focus, uh, you know, uh, bias and uh, gain adjustments. Rather, sorry, that was a cat lid, rather than uh, you know focus on the laser voltage first because that's always going to be what you need to adjust. Generally, you would never need to go into one of these to adjust the other pots really, unless the the tracking coils or focus coils are a bit worn or something. They don't wear, you know. It's like it either works or it doesn't. It's unusual to have to adjust them really, unless you've swapped out the laser. Um, and that's an important thing to note really is that you know you, when you swap a laser. It's, it's not always going to be 100% right, you may, you may have to mess around with these adjustments, the, the bias adjustments there and the gain adjustments to get that laser working perfectly with your system. But for the most part, the experience I've had with other systems, it tends to just work as long as you get the, 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 the RF level right here by adjusting the laser voltage on the optical pickup. Nine times out of ten, you won't have any problems. And something else worth sharing with you as well, I'll just switch it off. Um, the Maxell discs actually are worse, so that's a correction from the first video, these silvery ones. The RF level is a little bit less and actually it struggles to initially focus on that to detect the disc. Now I've adjusted the laser you know, correctly. Uh, and with these verbatim ones, um, they work fine. So yeah, I would suggest verbatim are a good uh, disc to get. Uh, you can see it's like a bluey sort of colour. The Tyrodin ones might be okay, I've not got any of those left I don't think. Um, the other thing that someone suggested, I forgot who it was, I'll uh, put his name up here I think, is the black, you can get black ones and those are apparently work really really well, so I might get some of those, I don't know. Dear Simon, I am pleased to announce that you have been chosen from literally hundreds of hopeful candidates to perform a death defying but extremely worthwhile quest, for which you will be rewarded quite a lot. 
So I thought it'd be useful to show you on uh, macro here. You can see the first pot there. Uh, I think that's uh, Seb. Yeah, the tracking bias, then the focus, focus error bias, uh, and then the gains, tracking gain, focus gain. So you can see the positions those pots are in. Um, it might just help you. So the other thing I've done to mine here is put two screws in there because there were no screws and the, underneath there's a you know a exposed copper on the PCB there to mate with the shielding. So it's it's important you've got a good ground there. You don't want it floating around inside. Uh, and then I've got the original screw which I think was holding the board, uh, which, which is meant to go in there to hold that uh, that final corner. And I guess the other thing to point out as well. I mean you can see where I removed the. Uh, the spindle thing there. Well, you can't actually, it's inside there. The other thing worth pointing out is you could see when I tested there, I didn't have this cable connected at all. Didn't have the, the, the sensor here for the lid. And it just works. It thinks there's a disc in all the time. So that's a really good way of testing it the way I had it there exposed. You don't need this connected at all. So I just fit in the TF328 back in there again as well uh, while I reassemble it. There's something else I wanted to mention. Uh, someone pointed out that ESD bags can be conductive on the inside as well as the outside. Uh, this one's not. I've tested on my meter uh, and I guess Mark did before he sent me the TF328 here. But if you remember in the previous video, I produced, um, I stuck onto the back here a piece of ESD bag. Now I had it the right way around. I did check connectivity on the inside to make sure it was isolated and it was. Uh, but I had to then go back and double check it just to make sure um, because uh, at the time I just assumed, I think I'd made the assumption the inside was not conductive and it wasn't so I'm okay with that and in fact I'm going to send that of the back plane back to Mark because he sent me this new one here it's got the uh, uh, key PS2 PS slash uh, 2 uh, keyboard adapter there and it's got a uh, connection for the um, RGB uh, video out here I've tested that that works I'll perhaps show you that in a minute before I wrap this video up but uh, I thought that was worth mentioning um, that if you do use an ESD bag just chest for resistance on your meter and I'm talking like you know get the probes within a millimeter of each other because uh, the resistance can vary you know you've got to make sure there's, there's no resistance there at all there's no con you know there's no conductivity it's uh, supposed to act like a Faraday cage but uh, I guess so we're all connected up via RGB there and I'll just show you it's a lovely crystal clear picture the uh, riser board actually was uh, designed by Kipper the one thing I would say is if you watch one of retro game mods videos when he did an RGB mod to a CD32, one of the things he pointed out there was the lack of clamping protection um, on the uh, RGB uh, side of things there. And I can't remember exactly what he did. I can't remember whether he um, used some transistors or something to isolate, or whether he did put some clamping diodes or something on there. I can't quite remember. But I just remember that he did it a specific way, you know. Um, so it's, it's perhaps worth having a look at how he did that. Um, I could be talking crap, I don't know, I'm just going off memory. I just remember him suggesting something along the lines that there was no clamping protection there on the RGB line. So, this is, you know, it's this board, the kipper board there, the uh, that bridge, uh, the riser board, it's just a pass through. So, that's just something to bear in mind, you know. Uh, I mean, it's not a big problem, it's just one of these things that to be aware of, I guess, you know, uh, me being aware of it has meant that I've connected up the RGB while everything's powered off and stuff, and then. You know, never mess with it while it's on, certainly not. As you can see, looking sweet. I still need to get some uh, black and white acrylic paint just to touch up these little dots here with a cocktail stick or something, as someone suggested in one of the earlier videos. Um, as I said uh, in the previous one, my white, I think my white had dried out. I've still got some black, but the white dried up. It doesn't last forever, that acrylic uh, sort of hobby paint. But that's all it needs, just a tiny little bit, really carefully applied, just to... Um, detract, you know, take your eye away from focusing on those little glitches there. Most people would probably just leave it as it is, but I'm a bit um, of a perfectionist, I guess. And the other thing I'll point out is, I'll, and again, I'll post a, a link in the description below, check out Retro Riot Gaming's channel. Uh, it's a bunch of guys that uh, get together once or twice a week and do videos, mostly gameplays and things for a few hours. They do live streams and things, and they're, they're fun to watch, actually. I watched uh, Bruce Lee video. Uh, it was just after Christmas, and I just ended up watching the whole thing for like two or three hours. It was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Uh, the way there was the banter and all that sort of stuff. So the other reason to mention Retro Riot Gaming actually is if you check out his channel, there's a few CD32 videos on there. When he first got one, 
he had problems with caps and things, and I think he did, uh, you know, swap some of the caps out. He had a video problem. He was uh, lacking composite, I think, signal. He had to, you know, uh, stick a patch wire or something there because some corrosion deep through a trace. So that's all interesting stuff. And I think he covered the 328 as well, um, the TF328, when he received one. So it's worth watching that video. Um, but also, I'd like to thank him because he pointed out a, a mod which I, I, I suspected was possible because I looked at the schematics of the CD32 and I come to the conclusion that the activity um, connector for the hard disk, you could perhaps connect that up to the activity connect on the compact flash card interface there on the TF328 uh, but I wasn't sure and at that point he, uh, he said uh, that's what Kipper had told him to do um, so it seems like a, a mod you can do I haven't done it yet on mine but uh, it's yeah this act, this LED here the idea is if you've got a TF328 in here and you've joined up those activity uh, connections this should illuminate when, you when you've got hard disk access. It's not too much of a problem because you can actually through these vents here, when the hard disk's been accessed, you can see the blue LED shining actually. Anyway, hopefully you found those few things interesting. Thanks for watching, I'll see you soon.